Welcome to a special edition of Medicine of Meadville. I'm Dwayne Kohler from Meadville Medical Center, and we're going to be on location today from Titusville Area Hospital. So let me get to that in a minute. I want to, I want to touch on one thing. Many years ago, probably in the neighborhood of 20 years ago, uh, in Meadville we had a, an education series called Medicine Meadville. So that's where, that's where our, our name came from. Um, every topic we have nowadays isn't necessarily about medicine. Sometimes uh, it's about health, sometimes about fitness and wellness and, and, and other things. And not every topic comes from Meadville. So uh, what made me think of that is we're off to Titusville today to, to, uh, to have a uh, a ribbon cutting for some remodeling at the at the entrance to the Titusville Hospital, which um, I think you'll be very impressed with. Lee Clinton, the COO at, at Titusville Hospital, is gonna gonna go through all that, and, and I think he's gonna also talk about some other new things that are going on. So. Looking forward to that. We'll have a health tip for you today from our friends at the American Cancer Society. It's a nice weather season, so we're gonna talk about sun health. And Dr. William Sonnenberg, one of the doctors at Titusville Hospital, will be talking about Lyme disease. So a lot to cover today, stay with us. On behalf of the board, the medical staff, and the employees of Titusville Area Hospital, thank you guys for coming. Really appreciate it. Uh, it's it's so nice to celebrate something positive, something as beautiful as this new lobby. So thank you, thank you all for being here, and uh, and sharing this evening with us. I'd like to thank a couple of people. Uh, all of this work was done uh, really between How Construction and the maintenance staff and our maintenance guys. They are just a phenomenal bunch of guys. They do really, really high quality work and they put in a lot of extra time, a lot of extra hours, a lot of evenings, weekends and nights to help give us what we all see here today. And I just really want to recognize them for a job well done. I forgot to, to tell you who I am. I'm Lee Clinton. I'm the CEO of Titusville uh, Area Hospital. Um, you know, we we had an old lobby that that didn't really give us the first impression that we wanted to give uh, our patients. We have about twenty five thousand people a year that come through uh, come through the lobby and register at these registration desks. So when you add you have the people that register and you have the visitors, the guests, the vendors, and just the variety of people that come through here. We're talking about 30,000 people a year uh, that walk through these doors and gain their first impression based on, on what they see. And we wanted to make sure that that first impression was a good one. Um, I couldn't be more pleased with the way this turned out. And, uh, and I, I, think, I think it's uh, undisputed that it's, it's really a beautiful place now. Um, we had some very generous donors that helped us with the funding of this. We had about $80,000 in donations from, um, from different individuals and from some charitable trusts, and I want to recognize them here this evening. Uh, the John Henney Charitable Trust, the 5M Foundation, Catherine Q. McKinney, and the Fleming Found Family Foundation. So between those four those four individuals and or groups, we had about $80,000 in donations uh, to help offset the cost of this. So they deserve a round of applause. So I've got a microphone, so I have to, I have to brag uh, a little bit. So we've been, we've been doing a lot around here uh, at TAH. Um, you know, I try to brag about the ER and what we've, been, we've done in the ER and been able to accomplish over the last year. We've done a lot to improve the timeliness in the ER. We recognize that that was an issue and um, we had some good people that put a lot of hard work in and we have reduced our door to dock time and our total time in the ER substantially because we wanna make, we wanna make it as good as an experience as we possibly can for our patients. Um, and our foundation, we recently revived the foundation. Uh, it had a three or four year kind of hiatus. Um, and so we've, we've revived that as of July. It was our first kind of new, new meeting um, in the last couple of years. And the decision has been made that we want to, now that we've um, improved some of the, the quality and the process issues in the ER, we want to make some, some physical improvements as well, some aesthetic improvements to help the flow 
and kind of help the experience from a physical perspective. So we're, we are launching a capital campaign uh, for the ER to improve that. So that will be really exciting. In addition, I want to brag on the clinical staff and the physicians. We've, we've accomplished a lot in this last year from a quality perspective. We achieved the maximum score on the Highmark Quality Blue Pay for Value program this last year. TAH is rated as a five star out of five in patient satisfaction by the uh, Centers for Medicaid Services, which is, I'm sorry, Medicare Services. We scored a 96% in the CMS core quality measures. And we've been rated a five star hospital in the Medicare Beneficiary Quality Improvement Program. So we've done some really exciting things trying to elevate the level of care for our patients. And all the credit goes to the nursing staff and the physicians here. They do a fantastic job. Very engaged group of individuals. <laughs> Finally, have some exciting news regarding our physical therapy program. We partnered with, or we are, we are partnering with Oil Valley Physical Therapy um, starting September 1st, where we are going to partner with them where we have our outpatient physical therapy relocated to their existing uh, location on Central Street. It's gonna provide significant better access, better parking, nicer environment uh, for our patients. And through their staffing, they're still gonna see the inpatients here at the hospital. So we're not closing the inpatient program here at the hospital. The inpatients will still uh, get the therapy that they need, but our outpatients will have a, a much more convenient uh, and nicer environment to receive their care September 1st. Really excited about that. I think it's going to be great for, great for the community. Okay, with that, what we are going to do, we are going to have a ribbon cutting with the Chamber of Commerce. And then following that, at 5.30, we're going to start the uh, Lyme's disease presentation by Dr. Sonnenberg. It's going to be in the cardiac rehab department. Around the corner, follow the signs. Before you go, please help yourself to the uh, punch and the snacks that's over here uh, by this door. And we also have raffle. We have a raffle going on for some giveaways over at this uh, at this uh, desk. So put your name in though. Put your name in there. Grab some snacks. 5:30. We're gonna have the presentation on Lyme's disease from Dr. Sonnenberg. Thank you all for coming. Really appreciate it. Brenda and Jill, you guys want to come up here? <laughs> Cardiopulmonary 3440. Cardio Emily, you don't want to be in it? Hi, I'm Sue Nightemp from the American Cancer Society, and I'm here to, with today's health tip. As you know, the summer months are ahead of us, and everyone likes to be outside and enjoy the nice weather, but I'm here to raise awareness of sun safety and to encourage you to take the steps you need to take to stay safe and to keep your skin safe. The biggest and most important thing I can stress is to wear sunscreen. If you're gonna be out in the sun, it's very important to wear a sunscreen of at least an SPF of 30 or higher. You can wear a hat, you can wear protective clothing. If you're going swimming, make sure you put your sunscreen back on. These are just such important things to save yourself from any dangers later in life or anytime and getting skin cancer. So encourage your friends and family to do the same. So have fun in the sun and just be safe. And that's your health tip for today, thanks.
I think Lyme disease probably represents a really fascinating story, and I'm going to set it up sequentially. Today's story involves what I'm going to say are heroes of this disease, scoundrels of this disease, get into the signs of this disease, solutions, how we can treat it, how we can pre prevent it, and the lessons we can learn from Lyme disease. First off, I want to set up a hero. This guy is Alan, uh, is Alan Steer. He was a talented violinist. He actually trained under Iksar Perlman. He had a wonderful career coming, but he actually developed a tremor in his finger that made him unable to play the violin. So thus he gave it up, went into the next best thing, medicine, and became an infectious disease expert. Later on, oh, in the 1970s, there was a lady named Polly Murray. She was in Lyme, Connecticut. Her family was racked with illness. Several of her children had these multitude of symptoms. Children all over the area seemed to be developing arthritic symptoms. And they were all being told that they had juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. She didn't think that was right. So what she did is she brought in Alan Steer. At the time, he was 32 years old. He was an infectious disease fellow at Yale University. He listened, he listened, he listened. He traced this disease. He spent several years studying it. And he came to the conclusion that this is tick-borne. It's either a virus, it's either a bacteria, but it's spread, and that's what it is. This guy listened to the patient. He discovered a new disease at the tender age of 33. So what happened? Uh, a few years later, a guy named Bergdorfia actually found the disease. It is a bacteria. It's a, kind of a pretty looking thing. It looks like a quartz crew that you use to open up a wine container. But uh, then later on, Years later, he suddenly was faced with these patients that were being referred to him that had really dubious symptoms, just being confused, just feeling weak and stuff like that, having no blood tests to support it being, being said it's Lyme disease. He became a villain because there, in the meantime, there had been developed this cadre of physicians who made a career out of diagnosing almost everything as Lyme disease. Thus, when they ever, this guy, who discovered the disease goes to a conference. He has to be surrounded by bodyguards. There has to be bomb squads checking their package. And the official proclamation is Steer has been scheduled for termination. This is the discovery. This story also has scoundrels, a case of medicine that has gone amok, really gone amok. OK, here's a case that actually happened. This is from the Mao Clinic, a female. She had knee pain since childhood. She had camped once in her life, no history at all of a tick bite at all. Her history included she had a gallbladder out, she got occasional headaches, every once in a while she complained of mental fogginess, she had transient numbness, you know, symptoms that any of us could have at any time. She had a periodic rash. She consulted in 1996 one of these Lyme experts to do it. Tests were run. Six tests were run for Lyme disease, all negative. Seven Western blood tests run for Lyme disease, all negative. PCR testing of the blood, of the urine, of the spinal fluid, all negative. In spite of this, she was declared to have Lyme disease by this Lyme expert. So what happened? Well, she was initially placed on an antibiotic called doxycycline. She still had weakness and stuff like that. It was later changed to another antibiotic, clarithromycin, then minocycline. By the way, minocycline, if you use it too long, will make your skin blue. She had a catheter placed in him. She re received uh, ceftriaxin, four milligrams IV every eight hours. That is a whopping high dose. When that didn't work, doxycycline IV was later added. This antibiotic regimen continued for 27 months. 27 months, she had that catheter in her. So anyways, what happened for eight months, she started losing weight. She lost 50 pounds of weight. She developed twitching in her extremity. She was confused. Her liver was large. She was jaundiced. This lady was sick. She spent a month in the ICU at a cost of $400,000. Her bloodstream, her heart was just filled with fungus. She died after a month of treatment. And what happened? She had a large clot that was just filled with this fungus. It filled the heart. There was fungus all throughout her lung. She had blockage of the left main pulmonary artery from this fungus. Autopsy, there was not a single finding of Lyme disease. Not a single finding of Lyme disease. I've run into a case, I ran into a case myself. This uh, lady came up to me after one of these lectures and said, 
You know, I had this joint pain two years ago that cleared up after a month, uh, but they told me I had Lyme disease. So she was on two powerful antibiotics for two years. Whenever she felt a little weak, she'd be, get put on the antibiotic. None of the blood tests showed Lyme disease. What did she really have? Well, it turned out when you're going to ask a little more questions, she had her children two years ago had a rash, slap cheek appearance. Her children had fifth disease. When a child gets fifth disease, they get a rash on their cheeks. When an adult gets fifth disease, they get an arthritis that for the world looks like rheumatoid arthritis, except it clears up on its own in a few months. This was never Lyme disease. This was a post-viral arthritis that occurred and was self-limited. There was no need for those two years of antibiotics. So what sort of people are we looking at? This guy is the head of the Lyme Foundation. What is his career? What is his CV? Well, he's kicked out of the University of California in San Francisco for falsifying data on an AIDS study. He became associate director of a penis enlargement clinic for two years. That failed. I don't know if the results were good enough. <laughs> but he went into, he became president of the International Lyme Society. That's the sort of guy we're looking at. What are the claims these people make? That this disease affects 18 million people in this country and we aren't recognizing it. 50% of all chronic illnesses claimed by these people are from Lyme disease. They claim it's sexually transmitted. There's no basis for that. It's transmitted to kids and causes birth defects. There's no evidence for that. And there's household transmission. There's no evidence for that. But they make good business of it. There are people, there are doctors in Pennsylvania who make big business of it. I've, there is a big increase in Lyme disease in the last few weeks. I've noticed that a lot. I've gone years without diagnosing a case of Lyme disease. In the last week, I've diagnosed three. There seems to be something going on. It's coming big. So what does my treatment involve? I see them for one office visit. I get the test. I put them on an antibiotic. I follow up once. No big expense. No big expense. The system the antibiotic I use is relatively reasonably priced. What do these people do? You never get over it. It's a chronic disease. It's sneaky. They put them on an antibiotics IV that costs up to 800 bucks a day. That's expensive. My patients are having good results. They feel good in two days. I, I, I think there's a sort of a scam going on here. So what are the signs that these people look for Lyme disease? Fatigue, memory loss, burning, stabbing pain, tremors, joint pain, shortness of breath, poor coordination, anxiety, slurred speech, swollen glands. If I get anxious, I'll get slurred speech. Chills, fever, vomiting, rash, muscle cramps, sudden mood changes, headaches, myalgias, poor concentration, light sensitivity, unusual depression, and ringing in the ears. Is there anyone in this room who hasn't had one of these symptoms? You all have Lyme disease, and you don't even need testing if you have one of these symptoms. Associated disease. What diseases do you have that us doctors make the silly diagnosis and really is Lyme disease. ALS, polymyalgia rheumatica, Bell's palsy, rheumatoid arthritis, chronic fatigue, scleroderma, multiple sclerosis, irritable bowel, Parkinson's disease, depression, middle ear pain, vertigo, rheumatoid arthritis. We are screwing up. We are messing up. This is really Lyme disease. No, I don't think so. Anyways, what is inappropriate treatment? They've given them treat injections of bismuth, bee venom, deliberately inoculate the patients with malaria. And I'll get into that. They give them simultaneous or sequential antibiotics for months and years. Malaria. This Lyme disease is a closely akin to syphilis. If you look at them under the microscope, they look kind of the same. They have this corkscrew appearance. Back in the old days, before they had penicillin, one of the ways they treated uh, malaria, uh, syphilis was to make the patient really, really hot. If you make a really hot fever, the spirochete doesn't do well, it dies. So what they used to do in the old days before antibiotics was deliberately give these patients malaria. Well, someone says, well, maybe we can do it now. Maybe you know, penicillin is too expensive or something like that. We'll make the patient sick with malaria. That has been done. Silver. Okay, this is funny. This politician, right winger, end of the world, is convinced that someday there'll be no antibiotics left when civilization comes to the end and zombies take over. So what he did is he loaded himself up with silver because silver fights all bacteria, the guy turned blue. Anyways, <laughs> silver has been used as a treatment for Lyme disease. The, tr the disease, that the, the, the syndrome they get is called agiria, which is blue skin. 
What's other treatment? They use hyperbaric oxygen, put them in super strong oxygen. It's supposed to stimulate the immunity. There is no evidence that this works. So who are the cast of characters in Lyme disease? Who are we dealing with? Well, first off, we have the bacteria. If you look at it, it does have a kind of corkscrew appearance. That looks for the world like syphilis, and it is closely related to syphilis. This is not a sophisticated bacteria. There's only a few genes on it, mostly genes that deal with the surface of the bacteria. There's very few genes that deal with metabolism. This bacteria does not have much of metabolism. It doesn't do much. It doesn't secrete any toxins. More importantly, there are no genes in it that create resistance. There are no genes in this that create resistance to antibiotics. Antibiotics will continue to work. This bacteria is slow growing. It doubles every 12 hours. Compare this to staph and strep. Strep doubles every 20 minutes. It grows fiercely. This grows slowly. So the evidence, sometimes it takes a long time for the blood test to turn positive because it's a slow growing bacteria. And also, you gotta give antibiotics a little longer because you gotta catch the bacteria at its vulnerable state. So you gotta give a longer course of an antibiotic with this disease. The white foot mouse. I've read lately that last year was a banner year for the white foot mouse. That's important because on the following year, there's gonna be a lot of Lyme disease if the white foot mouse is prevalent. This is the primary reservoir for Lyme disease and the ticks, basically the larva and the nymph stage. Up to 90% of these mice may be affected with Lyme disease. And the strange thing about this mouse is, is that the tick doesn't bother them. I think they think, this mouse think that ticks are mouse bling. Up to 100 ticks may be on a mouse, it doesn't bother them. It may be on their nose, it may be on their body. They just wear it, it doesn't bother them. They get sick, they just seem to love it. Unlike other animals who try to get rid of the ticks, the ticks bother it, it doesn't bother the mouse at all. So then we have the white-tailed deer. White-tailed deer is an edge species. They like to live on the borders between fields and forests. This is startling. There are 10 times more deer in this country than when Columbus came there. There are more deer. Why is one reason why is there more Lyme disease? There's more deer, simple reason. Why has this happened? There's nothing left to eat the deers. There's only guns and cars. And I've done my part with cars. <laughs> they are very fertile. I'm rooting for the hunters. Look at this graph. Look at how since 1880, how the deer population has markedly increased in the United States. This has gone up. This is one of the reasons why Lyme disease is so prevalent. So here's the family photo. We start off with the larva, the nymph, the adult male, and the adult female. The adult female is much, much bigger. So what's the life cycle? Well, it kind of starts out like this. Let me kind of draw it. You have this female right here, that's, oh, who lays the eggs. The larva may, uh, emerges in the first year, then it affects a small animal, usually the white-tailed mouse, and it spends its time there. It takes one meal and it molts. So it goes through the winter, they lie dormant. Then they come out in the nymph stage and they affect other mammals, dogs, anything like that, or the white-tailed deer. And they take their second meal, the female gets engorged, and they lay the egg. So you can see if there's a lot of involvement with the white-tailed mouse a year before, the following year, there's going to be a lot of Lyme disease. And I really think personally, and I think the lab people said this, they're seeing a lot of positive tests. This year is going to be a big year. So seasonal activity, when are you most likely to get it? In the summer when people are outside. Yet don't get Lyme disease in the winter. People are inside. Geographic uh, distribution, you can see probably the northeast coast is probably the biggest. We're kind of intermediate. But it's, Lyme disease has been described in every single state in the union. Here's the engorged female after she takes a blood meal. She latches on, she takes her meal, she literally increases in size a hundredfold. Then she lays her eggs. Look at those eggs. So anyways, what do they do? 
Well, the ticks do not fly. They don't jump. They don't drop. They just, you rub up against them and they attach to the skin. They cut into the skin. Look at that little thing. That can slice right into the skin. It excretes a cement and it holds tightly into the skin. During that period of time, during the feeding, it increases in size a hundredfold. It takes its blood meal. It takes a, at least 24 hours to feed. That's important, 24 hours to feed. What happens is it feeds, it feeds, it feeds, it gets a hundredfold, and it regurgitates a little bit of blood back. That's when the person gets infected. Not when it attaches, but when it regurgitates. And usually that occurs in about 24 to 48 hours. So the chance, if, if, it's, if the tick is on you for a few hours and you pull it out, you probably aren't going to get Lyme disease. It's probably pretty low. It's got to be in 24, 48 hours for you to get a reasonable test. And you can see how your chances of getting Lyme disease go up from one day to two days to three days. The chance goes up. So anyways, again, why are we seeing more of it? There's more ticks out there. The deer is overpopulated. <laughs> Ten times more deer now than back in our primal world. There's increased uh, in disease recognition. There is some evidence they've actually found Lyme disease in mummified remains of humans that have been in this country 6,000 years ago. It's already always been there. It's been in Europe, but we finally found it, thanks to Alan Steer. So we know how to spot it. We love having homes in wooded areas. That's partially to explain the fault, and there's more outside contact. So the clinical manifestations, what do you notice? Well, there's three stages of Lyme disease. There's the early localized form, the rash, early disseminated one when you start seeing systemic symptoms, and the late findings. So the early localized one. The early localized one is the classic target rash, erythema chronica migrans. During this period of time of the rash, you may have fever, joint pain, you feel sick like you have the flu, you may have an eye infection, you may have a stiff neck. Not everyone gets the rash, but when you see the rash, this is pathognomonic. That is a fancy term. If you see the rash, this is Lyme disease, there is nothing else. This is good enough for the diagnosis. Should you get a blood test? No. The blood test is worthless at this stage. It takes one month for the disease to show up as an antibody response in the blood, one month, because it's slow growing. The body is slow to develop antibodies. Don't get a blood test, it'll only confuse you. Treat this when you see the rash, but not everybody gets the rash. So it's, like I said, it's pathognomonic. You see it in most people who get infected. It's generally painless and it expands slowly. It may develop three days after the rash, usually seven to 10, I mean, three days after the bite, sometimes seven to 10 days after the bite. But it's not always typical. This was the rash of Lyme disease. This looks nothing like a target. Who knows, someone may blame this on the detergent change. It can have blisters. This can be Lyme disease. The facial rash. Now you may not spot this right away, but if you see there's a suggestion of a target-like lesion, a ring, but it's covered with hair. So therefore that can be sneaky. So then you go to the next stage. If it's not treated, if there's no rash or the rash isn't spotted, it occurs some embarrassing place where you can't see it, it goes on to the next stage. So the next stage is you develop more muscle pain, more uh, joint pain, you develop uh, palpitations, sometimes irregularity of the heartbeats occur, or neurologic problems. It can affect the nervous system. So what do you see? The acute neurologic things is Bell's palsy. Bell's palsy can be caused by Lyme disease, and especially in younger people. If someone has Bell's palsy under the age of 35, there's about a one-third chance that this is caused by Lyme disease. So I think it's reasonable to check maybe everyone uh, who has Bell's palsy with Lyme disease. You get radicular neuronitis, which means just the back plane hurts all over, the muscles hurt, and you can have a mild encephalitis, some cognitive clouding. You just don't remember things. There's some memory loss sleep problems, and changes in mood. So the uh, radicular neuronitis, it's painful, the back hurts, it may interfere with sleep, you feel tingling, numbness, burning of the back, and it can affect the limbs. Things are just plain sore. 
So finally, the last stage. If it isn't picked up, then you have the persistent late stage. And it can affect the heart, it can affect the brain, the nerves, or the joints. Carditis, it can affect the heart. It can affect all layers of the heart, but predominantly this affects the heart muscle. It doesn't affect the coronaries. It doesn't really affect the coronaries. It doesn't affect the heart valves. It affects the heart muscle. And it can occur shortly after the bite, four days or seven months. It's more likely to occur in males. It occurs later in the summer, into the fall. <coughs> this is interesting. The heart people seem to have less of a chance of having that rash. They have less than a half a chance of having the rash compared to 70 or 80% of normal patients. They're less likely to have the rash. So what are the symptoms? Lightheadedness, fainting, shortness of breath, palpitations, and chest pain. There have been deaths from the carditis of Lyme disease. This was recently reported by the CDC. Three patients, one woman, two males, all of in the northeast part of the country. They basically had a sudden collapse, and none of those three that died had the rash. So what, what does happen? It more affects the electrical system, how the heart functions in an organized manner, electric. So they can have a first degree block, which isn't so bad, second degree block, which is kind of bad, and if you haven't guessed already, a third degree block is bad. There's total disorganization between the top part of the heart and the lower part of the heart. You can have palpitations, you can pass out, chest pain, shortness of breath. Antibiotics work well. They'll reverse these blocks but sometimes they require a temporary pacemaker because the heart isn't functioning quite well until the antibiotics kick in. So then there, it involves the central nervous system, Lyme disease. So what you can see is you can see cognitive impairment, mental clouding, leg weakness, awkward gait. The first case I ever picked up with Lyme disease was a boy who had an awkward gait, who was just stumbling, who was falling over. That was Lyme disease. A facial palsy, Bell's palsy, a paralysis of the face, bladder problems, vertigo, or back pain. You can have psychiatric systems, symptoms. You can actually develop frank psychosis, panic, anxiety, and they describe the personalization. You just don't seem to be with yourself, the personalization. So then it can involve the peripheral nervous system. Like I said before, the radicular neuronitis, the Bell's palsy, up to 10% of patients. It's more common to be a cause of Bell's palsy in the younger patients. The Bell's palsy may predate positive serology. It may not show up on the blood test. So anyways, Lyme and the joints. If the patient is untreated, there's a 60% chance that the Lyme disease will advance and cause pain in the joints. This may occur weeks to years after the infection. These people have a delightfully high tighter on blood tests. It really shows up on blood tests when you have the joint pain. It usually involves larger joints, particularly the knee, but can involve the TMJ joint. So you have arthritis of the knee, you have mild to moderate pain, Baker's cyst may be formed, you may develop erosions. This is kind of cool. Lyme disease has even been found in an artificial synthetic joint. That's kind of neat. So the diagnosis, how do we make it? Well, we gotta look at the clinical picture. Does it make sense? Did they have the right exposure? Was there a tick bite? Do they go outside? Is there a history of exposure? Are they in the right part of the country where it's fairly common? And do they have a positive blood test? So you do the antibody response. Like I said, this is a slow growing bacteria. It doesn't multiply fast. So it takes a while for the blood test to turn positive. An IgM, which is a type of antibody that shows up first in infection, shows up at two to four weeks. The IgG, which is a more longer term antibody, shows up a little later. The IgM tends to decline. After about a half a year, the IgG persists. So there's a two-step process. When you go to the lab and get the Lyme titer, there's a two-step process. The first thing they do is an ELISA test. ELISA test is good at picking up almost anything. It has a high sensitivity. It picks up everything. Trouble is it picks up too many things. So sometimes it picks up things that are sort of like Lyme disease, but really aren't Lyme disease. So you got to go to the second test, the restroom blot. This is specific. 
forth. So you need the two-stage testing. You can't go on just one stage. So anyways, I'll kind of jump past this one. You can get false positive tests, particularly with the initial LISA test, because if you have syphilis, well, like Lyme disease, it may show up like Lyme disease. There are other forms of spirochetes in the body and particularly around the teeth. So if you have bad teeth, it may look like Lyme disease. There's a disease called relapsing fever, rheumatoid arthritis, and infectious mononucleosis can give a test that sort of looks like Lyme disease. So that's why you need the Western blot test. It's specific, it hones in on it. So lastly, how do we prevent Lyme disease? How do you stop it from happening? This is the vaccination. And this vaccine first came out in 1998. As soon as the vaccine hit the market, the Lyme literate physicians jumped on it. They grabbed patients, they had patients testifying in front of Congress that this disease was bad. I mean, this vaccine was bad. So what happened is finally the manufacturer had to take it off the market because they thought it was bad. This disease is kind of interesting. What it does is it creates antibodies. It doesn't work in the person, it works in the tick. So the tick sucks the blood out, it sucks the vaccine, the antibodies that the body makes, it kills the Lyme disease within the tick. When the tick vomits the blood back into you, it's totally non-infectious. The vaccine worked pretty well. What's the trouble is, number one, insurance companies didn't seem to cover it. Number two, it wasn't quite perfect. It was pretty good, but it wasn't quite perfect. But more importantly, it was hounded off the market by the Lyme literate physicians. It was hounded off on the market by the lawyers who claimed that they had patients who develop autoimmune diseases because of this vaccine. There was no evidence that this vaccine did any of it. And the last thing the Lyme literate physicians want is no Lyme disease. They love Lyme disease. They make a lot of money from it. So as a result, there is a very effective Lyme vaccine for your dog. There's no vaccine out there for humans. So people have actually gone to veterinarians and begged them to give them the vaccine. They can't get it. This is a quote, I believe it's from Alan Steer. Lyme disease is the only infection I know of where we have a safe, effective vaccine, but it's not available to the public. Now I understand late breaking news, there is a vaccine being fast tracked. I hope the hell this vaccine gets the respect it deserves because we need to do something to prevent this disease. So anyways, what another way you can do it is tick checks. If you get the ticks out soon, you won't get Lyme disease. If you get it under, uh, out under 24 hours, you probably won't get Lyme disease. Two studies have showed a benefit of early tick removal. So again, I go back to the chance of trans transmission. The longer the tick is, the more likely you are to get the disease. If it's under 24 hours, it's pretty low. So improper tick removal, sharp forceps crushing the tick before you take it out, squeezing it, petroleum jelly, gasoline, lidocaine, match, hot nail, don't do it, twist and jerking bare hands. The proper removal is using a set of tweezers and pulling it out. What if you get a tick bite that's been in over 24 hours and you're worried about it? There is a study in JAMA that showed the value of prophylaxis. A single dose, two capsules of doxycycline taken are 87% effective in preventing the rash of Lyme disease, thus preventing Lyme disease. The number needed to treat is 12. If you treat 12 people, you're gonna prevent one case of Lyme disease. It's pretty good prophylaxis and it's pretty simple. So what you can do, there are sprays that you can spray in your yard that actually kill the ticks. Clothing, wear light color clothing so you can see the tick. Tuck your pants into the socks, that's a really snazzy look, isn't it? <laughs> don't wear open toe shoes, don't wear sandals. Uh, ticks cannot survive in a dryer at an hour, for an hour. DEET at, 20 to, at 30 to 40% is the most effective. Apply to the clothes, it generally will not harm the material. Landscape management. 82% of the ticks that we run into are within three yards, 10 feet of the border. That's where you got to manage the ticks, at the border. Keep the lawn mowed, remove leaf, brush, and weeds at the edge of the lawn. Keep the areas open to the sun. Ticks don't like sun. There's the before and after picture. The after picture down below is what the yard should look like to help 
prevent ticks. So playground areas, that's a bad playground area. This is a good playground area. Good exposure to the sun. Ticks can't survive there. And deer control. We have 60 deer per square mile. I've killed three of them personally. <laughs> I need other people's helps out there. Deer resistant planting, fencing, and controlled hunting. And finally, we got to be cautious. We got to listen to the wisdom of Abraham Lincoln. Don't believe everything you read on the internet just because there's a picture with a quote on it. That is a quote from Abe Lincoln. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thanks, Dr. Sonnenberg. That was great. I, I, uh, my dog has been infected by Lyme disease this year, which is interesting, and I was, I was very fascinated by the topic as, as he was talking about that. Thankfully, the, the medication's working and, uh, and all is well with that. Um, also, thanks to our friends from American Cancer Society. We appreciate their help all the time with their health tips and, and uh, what they're doing. Um, and it was great to see the, uh, the remodeling at Titusville Area Hospital and, and hear about the new things that are going on. So, well, especially thanks to the folks at home for joining us today on Medicine of Meadville, and we'll talk to you next time. Thank you.